Welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Graviel and I'm a project manager at Charm City Meadworks. Tonight we'll raise a glass as we explore the important roles of wine and drinking in the music and art of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. I'm honored to introduce our experts on historic drink and song, Dr. Susan Forsher Weiss, who holds joint appointments in musicology at the Peabody Institute and the Department of Modern Languages at the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences at John Hopkins University and also Dr. April Edinger, who is a professor of art history, chair of the Visual and Material Culture Program and director of the recently inaugurated Swearin Wogan Institute for the Study of Book at Goucher College. Tonight's program is a little different. I'll begin with a quick presentation about our mead at Charm City Mead Works, and then Dr. Edinger and Dr. Weiss will share their presentations. We welcome you to ask any questions you have by typing them into the chat module on your screen throughout the talk and we will leave time at the end to answer them. Charm City Meadworks owner and co-founder, James Boycourt, will also be joining at the end to answer any mead-related questions you might have. We hope you're enjoying a beverage along with us. So now let's jump into our mead, which is going to be my presentation. So I don't know if anybody had the chance to pick up any of our stuff and please excuse me, I am in our guest bedroom because of some technical issues and I'm gonna try and uh, show you some stuff and make a cocktail up here. So. Um, from here, you can see it's our little, uh, we got a little variety pack here. These are all of our core flavors. Um, we do a mead, we do a little bit different than a, um, a typical style of mead you might be used to see. We specialize in off dry meads and we have this fabulous canned wine, which this is a variety pack, um, which are carbonated. And they're a little lower, like 6%, if anyone's ever had them around there. So we've got our basil lemongrass, our sizer, our elderberry, and our wildflower. Um, we basically mead, we start, um, it, it's alcohol made from honey. So whereas grapes, you, or whereas wine uses grapes and cider uses apples and beer uses grains, mead um, is made with honey. So you start out with the yeast and the honey and the water and um, Basically, the yeast eats the honey, and then we add in some nutrients while it starts and kind of take care of it while it's all going on. But that's the base of it is those three ingredients, uh, plus whatever flavors, you know, we decide to, to put in there to make it special for you. But, um, you know, that's the, the main gist of the process. Um, and then this is our core lineup. This, uh, our sizer right here is the, a sizer is a technical term for um, an alcohol for with apples and honey. So it's kind of a hybrid of both. Um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to, to pick it up ahead of time, um, but I wanted to go ahead and I put together a little cocktail uh, for everybody as well. I made a blackberry, black currant smash with bourbon. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try and put that together here, kind of on my guest bed and in front of the camera <laughs> and do what I can for you. And, um, I'm sure if anybody has any questions about mead or, or kind of all the interesting stuff that goes behind it and beekeeping, I see James there smiling. He's a, he's an incredible resource for all that, that I'm not really um, quite as great at, although I'm, I know a little bit, but so I'll go ahead and make my little cocktail and then I'll hand the, uh, the program off if you're online. So um, just a moment here. Do, do, do. So I started, I went out and I got a little, sh a little shaker today. So I'm going to add my ingredients here. I already have cubed ice in here. Um, <laughs> so I put, there's a couple limes in here. And then we want, so if there's anybody who's following along at home and I'm going too fast, um, I see the chat over there. So you can let me know but I've got a couple lines in there. And then it calls for five large mint leaves. And I don't know if you can see from here, but these mint leaves I got are piddly. So I'm gonna use 10 medium ones. <laughs> so I'm kind of just picking my mint leaves. I'm gonna put them in here. And this is, uh, they're just kind of going the bottom. 
because you're gonna wanna muddle them together with the lime and with the next ingredients we're gonna put in. Uh, muddling is just kind of like smashing with a long stick so you can use a spoon if you don't have a muddler or anything like that. Um, you know, I've, I've bartended a decent amount in my life, but it's been a while. So I got that, I got that. And then I am gonna add in one little shot of bourbon. I chose to use Snallygaster, which is a local bourbon made in Frederick, which is where I'm from, Frederick, Maryland. And um, it's named after a, a local cryptid legend out here. So I'm doing one little shot of my Snallygaster. And by little, I mean John-sized. And then this is our black currant red raspberry. So real quick before I continue, um, we do, so kind of meat is traditionally not carbonated. So uh, this here is in our bottles. It's a still meat, it's 12%. It's gonna be way closer to what a traditional meat is and what you might've heard of. Um, the black currant's actually the first one that we kind of ever did that was targeted towards red wine drinkers. The other stills we do are not red, they're almost, um, a little more uh, like a Riesling or a, that kind of thing, even though they're not wine, but you, they just as the profile goes and everything. So anyway, I'm gonna start with this one and in here, these are 12% and I'm gonna put in four parts of this one as opposed to the one of whiskey. So kind of four shot glasses of this one. And they're only, they're 12%, so. It's going to pack a little punch, but to be honest with you, I don't know how to make a drink that doesn't really pack a little punch. <laughs> it's just me. Three and four. Boop, boop, boop. All right, got that, that, and that. And then I got some honey here. This one in particular is Billy Bee honey. I've never heard of it before, but it's what I got today. I bet you we could probably find some better honey. I bet you James has some leads on better honey, but this is what I got. So this is what I'm going with. I'm gonna put a tablespoon of this honey in here. Tablespoons over here. Boop, boop, boop. Do, do, do. Tablespoon of honey, like that. Ooh, so sweet. That's a soup spoon, but it's okay. And I'm gonna pour that in there. Put it in. And then the blackberries. Then I got nine blackberries here. I went to a I went to the grocery store before this, and apparently they're all sold out of blackberries. So I don't know if uh I wasn't hundred percent sure if you shared this recipe ahead of time, but um Apparently blackberries are out of season and a little harder to get than I thought. So I bought this whole assorted fruit platter just to get myself some blackberries, but it's worth it. It's delicious. I tried a couple earlier, sorry. <laughs> so, and now I'm gonna take all those things and then what you wanna do is you wanna muddle them together. Just kind of make sure you mix up the blackberries. You get it all, I got it down in there. I already put the ice in. Typically you wouldn't want to muddle with the ice in there, but I'm upstairs and my fridge is downstairs. So I just kind of doing what works. Yeah. It's tastes really, 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 really good. So then I'm muddling up a little bit. You get that mint all muddled up. You get all the flavors out. You get the blackberry, you get all the flavors out. And I do that in the uh, in the shaker with whole ice cubes, regular ice, and then top of my shaker. Yeah. And then you shake it up in here and everything. And then I like to pour it over crushed ice. So I'm trying to find the top of my shaker. I think I lost it in my transition from downstairs to upstairs. I'm really, really sorry. So then you go here. And you go ahead. Can you see? We're in there, look at that pretty color. Oh yeah. And so you got bourbon, you got our black currant mead, 
blackberries, lime, mint, honey. It's awesome. So cheers. All right. And then let's see. So from there, sorry. I guess I'll go ahead and kick into the next part of our presentation here. And um, I'm sorry, I, uh, during all this transit and everything, I lost the, the shift of, I think I was introducing Susan, if that's right. Now, yeah. April, I see you. Me. Are you next to April? <laughs> right. I'm next. I'm really yeah. sorry, but April's <laughs> no going to come with Susan and uh, do your presentation. And um, yeah, I hope you all enjoy. And I'll be here throughout the thing if you all have any questions. And I'll be here at the end with uh, James, too. So I, I hope that. Uh, I hope, uh, I'm interested. I'm excited to see what happens. So let's go. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And John, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, this is the magical mead part of the title. And I would say that magical might be one of the key words that we should include in the drinking game that I'm about to introduce because it really is at the heart of, of our lecture tonight, our, all of our contributions. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm April Ottinger from Goucher College, and I'm going to give you a kind of whirlwind tour through some of the visual and philosophical underpinnings of the music that um, Susan Weiss is going to be talking about. And Susan is one of my uh, wonderful treasured colleagues in, in Baltimore. And um, Susan and I quickly we came together in 2012 because we discovered we each had a, a common interest in the history of, of wine in medieval and Renaissance visual culture, as well as uh, song. And we both spoke at a conference at the Renaissance Society of America. And then we're invited to Boston to give an encore. And, and so whenever we have an opportunity to come together, it is always a treat. And it's especially a treat to be able to collaborate tonight with Charm City Meadworks. So um, I, I uh, come to this, uh, this part of my presentation with a prop. And I'm afraid I don't have mead this evening, nor did I come with a magical cocktail but I did come with a glass of wine. So perhaps for anyone who didn't have a chance to mix that marvelous cocktail or try something from Charm City Meadworks, you might have in hand uh, a libation. And this is relevant to the drinking game that I would like for all of you to uh, be aware of is a component of tonight's presentation. And uh, all of the words that you see here are words that you will hear as Susan and I present our part of uh, the presentation. And uh, each time you hear one of these words, you should take a, a drink. So when you hear the word wine, I've just demonstrated that is what you do. And, and fortunately, um, the folks at Hopkins have done a wonderful job at uh, organizing this list and just sort of posting it. You should be seeing it at the bottom of your screen. But, but if some of those words start to dance around on your screen or become blurry, then I can assure you, you're doing a good job with the drinking game. So just keep going. So let me move on to my part of the uh, presentation. It's going to be a very quick run through to just give us a little bit of a, a visual setting for the topic of the cultural history of wine in medieval art and Renaissance art. And uh, we all know who Dionysus or Bacchus is, the Greco-Roman god of wine, of agriculture, who runs around in the forest with an entourage, always drunk, always dancing in uh, complete free reverie. And uh, just to give us a picture of one of the many, many renditions of Bacchus in the history of art, this is one of my absolute favorites that I couldn't not include in tonight's discussion. It's Michelangelo's Bacchus from 1496, 1498. It was one of his uh, earliest monumental sculptures. And 
It's a, a vision of uh, the drunken Bacchus who's even uh, about to fall over. You see he's a bit off balance. And in fact, uh, he's had a bit too much of the grape. Did you hear that word? Grape, that's one of our words. So he's imbibed a bit and uh, he's inebriated. <laughs> All right. So he's here with one of his satyrs who is uh, chowing down on the grapes. And now in Michelangelo's time, you might ask, well, you know, Michelangelo belonged to a uh, sort of a predominantly uh, Christian context. And, you know, how does this Greco-Roman God enter into the story of, of wine? in a Christian context. And so that was the more focused theme that I wanted to run through in uh, this very brief uh, time that I have here. So we'll take a quick uh, kind of quick, quick run through uh, the Middle Ages, really starting from late antiquity and uh, where Bacchus enters into Christian iconography in, uh, for instance, the form of uh, sarcophagi or the funerary contexts where in these two examples of these are Christian sarcophagi, that is uh, these elaborately carved coffins um, in precious marble. Um, the one on the left, the sarcophagus of Constantina, the daughter of Constantine on the right, Junius ba Bassus, um, who was a Christian uh, Roman um, statesman. And uh, Bacchus enters into the funerary context because of the transformative qualities of the grape. And uh, so in both of these examples, you can see these uh, puti, these little cherubs who are, who look like they're dancing around in, uh, in little barrels of grapes. In fact, they're making wine as we uh, look here. And the wine uh, is the transformation of the grape into this absolutely magical, elixir, um, not quite as wonderful as the Charm City Mead Works, but nonetheless a delicious wine. And uh, this of course was hand in hand with uh, the symbolism, uh, well, actually the, really I should say the miracle of uh, the Eucharistic wine, that's the, the blood of Christ, which was uh, transformed miraculously at um, the moment of the transubstantiation in the mass. So wine was already in the, uh, even in late antiquity, had a kind of transformative quality linked with Christianity. But the imagery that we see in uh, early Christian iconography is really Bacchic imagery. So this is really a synchronic uh, com coming together of this Greco-Roman tradition of Bacchus with the idea of the Eucharist and the blood of Christ. So um, we see this in, in many different examples, not just in sarcophagi, but also in uh, mausolea, as in this uh, marvelous mausoleum of Santa Costanza, one of my very favorite spaces to visit in, uh, in Rome, and uh, again, the burial place of Costanza. And in the, uh, in the vaulting of the ambulatory, which runs around the, uh, the altar here, is this uh, beautiful mosaic, again, with these, these putti who are making wine in this really charming kind of rustic scene. They look like a bunch of purple men who are squishing the grapes, making juice. And again, it's that transformation that is key here. And it's not just transformation. And those of us who love wine, as I do, um, also know that the transformation is, is also drunkenness, but it's a kind of a, 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 a mystical uh, Christian drunkenness, elevating the soul on high. So we'll leave that concept behind and move a little bit later into the, uh, the high middle ages with Piero de Crescenzi. And uh, some of you may be curious about, you know, what did people know actually about making wine? in the Middle Ages. And well, for that question, we actually still should start in antiquity because there were a number of uh, classical authors such as Pliny the Elder, uh, who talks about winemaking, Palladius, there are others, but um, Piero de Crescenzi is our guy when we think about the uh, Middle Ages and a bestseller called the Libro Ruralium Commodorum, the book of rural things. And it was a treatise um, that was, uh, written in uh, around the 13th uh, century 
And it was uh, sort of a demonstration of all of the matters of agriculture. And there are two big sections in this book that are all about making wine. And uh, so I'm just showing you one of the beautiful uh, illuminated manuscript copies, um, this one from the 15th century, which uh, shows uh, the author here, Crescenzi, showing his patron, who is a Bolognese prince, his way into this elaborate garden. So, you know, gardening and agriculture are activities of uh, the nobility. They're sophisticated activities. And so, you know, wine and, and, um, and viticulture belongs to the sophisticated intellectual activity of mixing and concocting uh, marvelous wines. And so again, there are two sections in this book um, that describe in detail um, the methods for, um, for cultivating grapes, for uh, instance, attaching them to uh, the vines and to arbors, um, effective tools and uh, practices of crushing the harvest. And uh, again, I'm showing you a yet another copy, this one, a printed copy uh, out of Speyer in Germany. Again, just to give you a sense that this was a bestseller and it was even uh, translated into lots of vernacular languages. It was uh, so widely read. And just to give you a sense of uh, one section, my favorite section about uh, viticulture is in the eighth book, uh, which describes, and I won't read this uh, word for word, but it describes um, miraculous graftings, the idea of how do you uh, most effectively graft uh, a vine to a cherry tree in order to produce a new kind of flavor of wine. And, and this brings me back to the topic of transformation. So in this sense, this is uh, now not the Eucharistic transformation, but it's a miraculous transformation made by, um, by uh, creative techniques. And so you can imagine that winemaking um, and raising and cultivating grapes easily becomes a metaphor for creativity and for the imagination because the bottom line is always a miraculous transformation of one substance into another. Maybe we could even call it a kind of an alchemical, an alchemy, uh, but in the form of viticulture. And so I, I thought I would move to just one, uh, one uh, chapel that is an example of a Renaissance uh, vision of viticulture. And what we're looking at here is uh, Lorenzo Lotto, who was a Venetian painter whose career spanned the first half of the 16th century. And uh, he spent a very long sojourn in uh, the city of, of Bergamo. And I just nod to the wonderful people of Bergamo um, who were so much in the news uh, last spring. Um, but they have uh, many masterpieces by uh, this painter who moved from Venice to Bergamo for a long sojourn. And uh, one of these masterpieces was this chapel and the Oratorio Suardi. And it was a chapel on the grounds of a villa owned by a very sophisticated noble out of Bergamo from the 16th century who clearly wanted his chapel decorated with images of a uh, of, of a trellis with grapes and images having to do with, with viticulture and Eucharistic transformation on one hand, but this was also a very sophisticated chapel, which was also about humanism as well. Um, what we might call a kind of a viticultural humanism, sophisticated, poetic. And so uh, just quickly, I'll show you uh, the central figure is Christ, who's literally his fingers become vines that grow and curl up into the ceiling. And in the ceiling are uh, grapes, uh, grape arbors. And the, uh, uh, another view here, so you can have a closer look of Jesus, uh, who's again, the, the curls of the vines frame uh, images of saints. And we go to the ceiling and here are a bunch of these uh, puti again, who are tending to the grapes, a very Bacchic image that is drawn very much out of that late antique tradition is the continuation of that. And in their little hands, they have lots of uh, scrolls with biblical excerpts all about wine. So every single one of these little excerpts in Latin is some phrase out of the Bible 
about the miraculous properties of the grape and its significance for the Eucharist. But again, more broadly, it's about transformation. And so uh, that is very clear. The poetic transformation idea is uh, very clear with some of these puti who very eagerly uh, display bunches of grapes to the onlookers who remember standing down below because this is on the ceiling. But perhaps my very favorite is the puto who is I will call them the mixturating puto, the puer mingens. If you haven't forgotten, that's one of your words. The puer mingens means the, we'll put it nicely, the mixturating puto. I'll drink to that. And he, um, this image is a uh, very, <laughs> believe it, playfully but sophisticated image that is all about inspiration. It's a widespread image in Renaissance iconography. Um, but again, it, it, it mirrors this idea of, of inspiration and transformation. And I see I need to wrap up, but uh, I thought what better to wrap up with than, than Caravaggio and the idea of wine and sensuality in, uh, in this image of Bacchus, another one of my very favorite images of Bacchus in Renaissance visual culture. But uh, then of course we, we descend uh, you know, from, from the heady to the body and the moralizing and the vernacular, you know, with Jan Stein and uh, even, even greater into the uh, David Teniers, the monkeys in the tavern who are getting drunk. So I will turn the, uh, the lecture over now to Susan and uh, thank you so much. Hey, Susan. Thanks, April. Uh, can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Good. Um, so the title of my talk is A Hair of the Dog, which is part of a song that my students will sing and hopefully you'll sing with them at the end. Sources of syncretism in drinking songs from ancient to modern times. And as April said, we've been around this rodeo before, but this is a slightly different way of doing it. We've never done it in Zoom. So bear with me. My music may have a life of its own. Uh, here is one of those sarcophagus. Uh, this one of Bacchus and Ariadne with music and dancing and uh, all kinds of, of activity. I have a couple of quotes um, first from Nietzsche. For art to exist, for any sort of anesthetic activity or perception to exist, a certain physiological precondition is indispensable, and that is intoxication. I think that might be one of our words. You should take a drink. Carson McCullough's In the Heart is a Lonely Hunter said, next to music, Beer was best. I tried to find a mead quote, but we'll get to that. 27 centuries ago, Homer wrote, Bacchus opens the gate of the heart. Bacchus and the wine urges me on. The bewitching wine, <laughs> which even sets a wise man to singing and to laughing gently and rouses him up to dance and brings forth words which were better unspoken. Aristophanes in his comedy Lysistrata champions wine music and dancing as the chorus of Athenians sing to Bacchus and his maids while the Bacchantes wave their wands in wild revel of the wine god. The god of wine, Bacchus, you can take two sips, and his counterparts intertwine and conciliate drinking as both virtue and vice in the artistic and musical culture of Western Europe from antiquity through to the present. The god is frequently portrayed in literature and film. One of the earliest portrayals is the ancient Greek play, The Frogs of Aristophanes. April has already shown you a number of these uh, Greek and Roman examples in art, and they all involve singing, dancing, and musical instruments. But here's a more contemporary depiction for a little diversion, um, and you probably all know this. Yes, uh, that is Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony uh, section of Disney's uh, Fantasia portraying Bacchus as the obese, tipsy, and lusty buffoon with a small donkey, uh, Silenus, as his companion. Um, the strains of the 19th century sea shanty, What Shall We Do With a Drunken Sailor, brings to mind our ancient mariner, uh, Bacchus, and you probably all have heard this. It's quite a raucous. Yes, no. 
Yes, we'll get back to a less raucous version of that. Um, in one of the verses, the chorus sings, give him a hair of the dog that bit him. The use of the phrase as a metaphor for drinking more alcohol as the treatment of a hangover dates back to Shakespeare's time. That derivation is from the medieval belief that when someone was bitten by a rabid dog, a cure could be made by applying the same dog's hair to the infected wound. The expression in Latin, similia similibus, curantor, or like cures like, dates back to the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates. In mariner cultures, the sea is the locus in Minas, and the sailboat invented in Mesopotamia, the home of the drunken sailor. The story of the Roman god Bacchus, Bacchus, the god of wine and intoxication, would be unknown to most children. Um, the drunken sailor, unless they had sucked the sept septembral juices, as did Gargantua in book five of Rabelais' 16th century novel, which mentions another canonic drinking song, No Bear O Bien Bu, Our Forefathers Drank Well. Dr. Rabelais supports the notion of the syncretic transference, transference of drinking, literally, into drinking metaphorically, ethically, intellectually. That is, those who drink freely are thirsty for knowledge. So drink away. This dualism is reflected in various interpretations of the Bacchus story, and we'll return to those. But because this is Johns Hopkins, and let's hope we can do this here, we thrive on scientific evidence. And believe me, I tried to look for evidence of, of, a, um, <laughs> of a bee, but unfortunately, all I came up with was, was the Drosophila. Uh, for why wine, beer, mead, and you can drink here, and other alcoholic and fermented beverages seem to be the go-to elixirs in moments of despair, particularly in matters of unrequited love. Um, scientists at UCSF, and this is in the journal Nature in 2012, if you'd like to read the data, I have found that male fruit flies court the females, but despite their courtship songs are sometimes rejected. This is an image of them. Apparently, he's singing to her. Um, when this happens, they are more likely to choose uh, their tubes in, in the little containers, food impregnated with wine over the alcohol-free offering. And this is what happens to the poor chum um, after he's had the, the alcohol, right? So skipping ahead to the 11th century and the Middle Ages, uh, the Carmina Burana were Latin songs sung by young German students, possibly lower orders of clerics who wandered the countryside, uh, singing the news and songs about love. They were quite bawdy, raunchy songs, especially about their times in the taverns, singing about life. In this one, Tempus Est Jocundum, It is the Time of Joy, a young man tries for several verses to seduce a young girl, at first unsuccessfully, but at last she succumbs to his advances. He keeps singing a refrain that gets progressively amorous and slower in tempo as the alcohol takes effect. He sings, oh, oh, totus flori, oh. And in translation, that's, oh, oh, I am all a flower. And he ends with, es quo perio, of which I am dying, but not real death, the metaphorical la petite morte. And note the monkeys, April's already mentioned them, the goblets, I think you can take a drink on that one, and the wine barrel. And uh, we'll listen to a bit of this and then talk about something on the other side. Let's go ahead to where he's almost having the assignation. Uh, how about right about here? Okay. <laughs> Veni, domicella cum gaudio. Veni, veni pulcra, iam pereo. Oh, oh, totus floreo. 
think you know what happens there. Um, clearly, he, he does finally uh, get her where he wants her. And uh, this is a manuscript page from, from the Carmina Burana songs, and you can see the text. What you can see above them are little squiggles, and those are actually nooms, and they're very hard to transcribe. Uh, you probably know the Carmina Burana better through the composer Carl Orff, who did uh, his own version of it. Um, by the late Middle Ages and Renaissance, these drinking songs are written mostly in the vernacular. We're going to hear this in a moment. Uh, but on the left is one of the portraits Titian painted of Bacchus and Ariadne uh, for um, Duke Alfonso d'Este in Ferrara. The painting is sort of used as the cover of this performance uh, by somewhat preco precocious Italian schoolchildren of a work of poetry by Il Magnifico, Lorenzo de' Medici, one of his Canti Carnicialeschi or carnival songs uh, that was set to music by an anonymous composer that praises Bacco, in Italian it's Bacco, with dialogue, singing, dancing, and playing instruments. It, it's really um, quite precious and we'll, we'll just see a part of it where they're speaking and then they go into song. Ora. Ciò che esser conviene Chi vuole essere lieto sia, de domanda, de certezza. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll skip to the most famous composer of this period. <laughs> has a mind of its own, um, Josquin de Pre, who maybe did compose this, but nobody knows. There's debate as to whether or not he is the composer. This is about a cricket, El Grillo. Or maybe it's about Cardinal Grillo, who was a poor singer, but it says here that El Grillo is a good singer, and he holds his note for a long time, and he drinks and he sings, um, and he's a good singer if he drinks and he sings. And you can hear them uh, here going back and forth with Dale, Dale, Bevi, Bevi, Grillo, Grillo, Canta, Canta. So I know we didn't put Beve in there, but you can have a drink anyway, because Beve is Italian for drink. Another of Titian's um, wonderful paintings for Ferrara is the Bacchanal of the Andrian. Um, and this one shows the people on the Greek island of Andros depicted making merry on the river of wine that Bacchus uh, had created. The hero's inebriated followers await his arrival as they drink from the island's river, flowing not with water, but with wine. <laughs> the mood reflects both the hedonism of the patron, Alfonso, and the agricultural prosperity of the Ferrari's countryside. The ladies are holding music, which appears to be a melody only, and you can see the melody here, and it says canon uh, on the side. Um, set to a text, and the text is qui bois et ne rebois, and il ne sait que boire soit. He who drinks and does not drink again does not know what drinking is. On closer examination, it turns out to be not a fragment of some contemporary drinking song, but a musical riddle. The word canon in the margin gives the first clue. Uh, it indicates the melody is to be sung by several voices entering at different times, which is our modern round. Uh, the music painted is seen by Titian's figures. It's upside down and in reverse to us looking at the picture. There are some dots um, that appear above and below the melody, indicating timing and pitch of the entering voices. Further, in order for the song to work as a canon, each singer must sing the melody one step higher on each repetition. If that's not confusing, then what, el what else is? It turns out to be the only workable solution. Indeed, the singers into their cups might not be able to produce accurate pitches. The inaccurate ones that result may therefore be attributed to either the intoxication of the singers or to a quality of rusticity uh, prominent in the arts at this time. So as the melody swirls around the falling fourths, Titian creates a spiral design from dancers to singers to drinkers, each in turn passing out in the song. 
Two years later, um, in 1521, in Rome at the Vatican Palace, Pope Leo, who is actually the son of Lorenzo il Magnifico, the Medici, uh, like Alfonso d'Este, one of the great patrons of music, was fingering a golden wine goblet embossed with the story of Bacchus and Ariadne. Music was performed, and one of the compositions was Adrian Villart's Quid non Ibrietas that you see here in the Latin, uh, a piece set to a poem from Horace's fifth epistle. It looks like a motet, and the uh, translation of the poem is, what cannot drunkenness do? It reveals secrets, makes secure our hopes, urges the coward into battle, removes the burden from worried mi minds, teaches new skills. Whom has the flowing wine bowl not made more elegant? In a treatise written by Giovanni Artusi almost 80 years later, and this is the music from his treatise, it was considered to be an exquisite example of Franco-Flemish polyphony. Uh, it was reported that the Pope's singers, probably because they were into their wine goblets, were not capable of performing it. The serious and dignified puzzle canon that describes the pleasures of alcohol may arguably be one of the most complex compositions, musical compositions of the 16th century. The polyphony and modulations through a circle of fifths may depict a tangled grapevine. Uh, grape is in there, so you can take a sip. The piece entered upon the musical stage in the humanistic gown of a Horatian epistle and pretending to have been conceived, if not in sin, certainly under the protection of Dionysus. We won't hear it, but we'll go on to uh, a piece, a French piece, because the French also, I mean, believe they have better wine, right? And this was published in part book, so each singer had their own part book. And if someone made a mistake, you could tell who it was. Anyway, they... Um, this particular composer wanted the singers um, to depict, to sort of fall down drunk at the end. So there are longer note values at the end of each part, slowing the tempo. It's, and, and so the text here at the end says, or otherwise it would be better to shut up and please be careful to sing you shouldn't drink. And I thought I would have uh, you hear a performance uh, by some of the Peabody alums who sang this a few years ago. I'm sorry we don't have one of April singing the last time we did this because she's a beautiful soprano. Um, so we'll listen to a little bit of this at the end so you can see where they are actually um, falling down. Let's go to about here. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, they had a great fun doing that one. Um, let's see if we can go to one of the last ones. This is the great late 16th century cosmopolitan composer Roland de la Suze, uh, known as Orlando de Lasso, and he signs his name with a little staff with a la and a so. Um, he uh, combined the seriousness of a Latin motet, Audite Nova, listen up, you fellows, oye, oye, uh, with a raunchy German lead about geese. And I um, bolded some of the words, long, fat, thick. Uh, you'll see, you'll hear that. And then a kind of onomatopoeia on sheer pluck, skull, roast, carve, and devour it. And at the end, he says, bring some good wine and pour bravely. Let us drink good wine and beer to the boiled, roasted young goose. Here's the motet.
it's wonderful. Um, and he's a wonderful composer. Um, we had to have more Caravaggio. I mean, she wet your April, you whetted our appetite. Um, at the close of the Renaissance, the beginning of the Baroque era, we have the birth of opera. And this magnificent painting, The Musicians by Caravaggio, contains all the symbols of Bacchanalian lust and stupor, the grapes over on the left, uh, a lute, a violin, music books, and debauched androgynous young males. Let's fast forward, just for the ending, uh, to 19th century opera drinking scenes or brindisi's, such as those by Giuseppe Verdi uh, in, of course, La Traviata, the Libiamo uh, from uh, 1853. We'll just hear the very beginning. The tea. And Verdi pauses there, so they have time to drink. Um, at the very end of his life, one of his last operas, um, Otello, is a very different kind of drinking song, Beva con me, sung by uh, the evil Iago. Uh, and you'll notice that the orchestral accompaniment sort of shows him getting tipsier and tipsier. Um, let's just hear a little bit of this. <laughs> Yes, um, sarcastic in some ways, ironic. Um, but Johann Strauss, the Waltz King, did it not only with words in the Champagne Waltz, where they said Champagne was to blame, tra la 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 la, for what we've endured today. A little tiny bit of this, which you all probably know. All right, so you know they're singing, but he does it without singing in uh, the famous wine, woman, and, and song um, waltz. And uh, this is a wonderful quote. Who does not love wine, wife, and song will be a fool for his life long. So I'd like us to end uh, with the song we began with. And I'd like to thank my Peabody students, Philip Barsky, Madalena Orbach, Zoe Scheller, and the engineer, um, Niels, uh, who did just a wonderful job uh, recording this. And you'll hear them sing it as a round. It's, it's not a... Um, what shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? So, um, Philip begins, and then Madalena comes in, and then Zoe. I, I think that's the order. And then they'll sing it all together, unison, and join them when they sing it unison. You can join them in the round, too, if you like. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What, what shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Way, hey, and hey, and up she rises. Way, 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 hey, and up she rises. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Early in the morning, way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises. Early in the morning, shave his belly with the rusty razor, shave his belly with the rusty razor, shave his belly with the rusty razor. Early in the morning, way hey and up she rises, way hey. She rises, way, hey, and she rises early in the morning. They didn't sing Give Him a Hair of the Dog That Bit Him or Put Him in Bed with the Captain's Daughter. And there are so many other verses. We didn't have time for all of them. So I end with this rebus from a manuscript, a Renaissance manuscript in Basel, Switzerland, that uses a whiskey barrel and other 
symbols of drinking um, and of, of inebriation instead of notes. It's a great fun piece and I thank you all. So I now uh, will turn it over to James, I guess, right? Hi guys, I just wanna say uh, this was great and thank you uh, in particular to, to John uh, for uh, leading in here on uh, Charm City's behalf. Um, April and Susan, that was uh, wonderful. Um, I'm James Boycourt, I'm the founder of Charm City Mead Works. And as it so happens, um, because I got into uh, this sticky mess uh, starting in college, um, I happen to know a little bit more about both uh, mead um, and the history of mead and bees than uh, one might otherwise normally. Um, and the first thing that I thought was kind of interesting actually, Susan, was uh, the Drosophila um, fly thing that you brought up. It turns out that, um, as we know all too well at the Mead Works, um, much to our consternation, uh, Fruit flies actually feed uh, on yeast. So anytime that wine is present or sugar is present, you're gonna have lots of fruit flies and they're highly attracted to wine, which is why at summer parties and that kind of thing, they're always around you. Um, if you've been into the back of almost any winery, it's, uh, it's a serious challenge during the summertime dealing with them. Um, I'm going to um, answer questions as people give them, uh, but otherwise I was just going to give a little bit of history on um, mead and bees um, uh, and sort of fill in a couple of the blanks. I, I asked, um, you know, Sydney, Susan and April if, um, you know, it might be good for me to sort of fill in a Q&A, but we, um, there's a, there's a lot of little minor things that I just thought might be interesting to put in there. We had a uh, audience question from someone named Dana asking um, how long mead takes to ferment. And the answer is it varies quite a bit. Um, at Charm City, we really try and do uh, lighter, uh, drier meads, which actually turn to, out to ferment pretty quickly. You can do them in um, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, and that as the sugar content and as the alcohol content increases, which goes sort of hand in hand, and by sugar, I mean honey, because it's mostly sugar, um, that um, fermentation time takes quite a bit longer. Um, it takes the, the larger the sugar content of the meat, it's sort of a um, logarithmic thing, um, it'll take a whole lot longer for the uh, mead to ferment. Some of the um, Polish uh, sort of sweet holiday meads that are really, really um, full of honey um, take, you know, months to really come out the way that they're supposed to. Um, Sydney's going to pass along uh, questions to me for many of the audience uh, members. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'm just going to say that throughout history, um, you know, mead in particular uh, and honey has always had a very sort of special spot. Um, a lot of people often associate mead um, incorrectly with uh, the Renaissance, which is uh, you know, by the time the Renaissance came around, it was really uh, almost uh, out of uh, use or fashion because um, people had figured out the brewing process for beer um, and also how to really cultivate grapes on a larger scale. And both of those were, um, you know, a good bit cheaper. Um, it, also distillation had kind of come in uh, by the time the Renaissance came around so people could make um, hard liquor. Um, and because of the scarcity uh, 
of honey, uh, it was, you know, a much harder thing to make meat. It was saved for, for really special occasions. Um, it is probably, um, because the water, Just a question real quick. Um, uh, so meat is uh, considered to be probably the oldest uh, form of alcoholic beverage. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, debate about that, but uh, based on some residue they found in bowls in China and somewhere else, um, they've uh, established that um, fermenting honey was probably one of the first things and that water would get um, mixed with the honey and sort of naturally ferment, people probably had it. The truth is that most uh, early fermentations tended to be mixed and that you would have grain uh, mixed with some honey and or some grapes. Um, there was a lot of, uh, through Mesopotamian times, a lot of that kind of mixing things in order to get yeast. Um, um, so we had a question uh, from DJ asking, what is the first historical reference that I'm aware of uh, to what we now call mead? And the answer is, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm tired and I don't uh, remember. Uh, this is a lot of anecdotal uh, stuff through years of reading and I wish I could cite it. Um, but uh, it's, um, I, you know, this is just for me reading through the years. We have Carol, what is generally the alcoholic content of mead uh, compared to wine? And the answer is uh, mead is uh, much more versatile than a lot of, um, you know, wines and alcoholic beverages. There are versions that are down as low as 4% alcohol and some that go up to 20%. Uh, the 4% stuff would be a sort of a very light uh, effervescent um, mead. And while we make a, a lighter, more effervescent kind, there's also, um, though they may not call it mead, versions of mead similar to what we make in Poland and other countries. Poland tends to be the center for a lot of mead and that they also have some uh, really interesting, uh, much more honeyed um, alcoholic meads, but a lot of theirs have some pretty heavy refinement too. Um, uh, in any case, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If anybody has questions for me, um, you know, also feel free to email us at uh, Charm City Mead Works. Uh, we have no way too much about uh, bees in this uh, ancient beverage that we make. Um, let me pass it back to April to finish up. Hi, thank you so much everyone for joining us and to my co-presenters, uh, Susan and John and James from Charm City Mead Works. This was such, such a pleasure and so much fun. And so uh, wishing you all a, a very wonderful evening and uh, filled with uh, magical elixirs and, <laughs> and transformation. So thanks very much and have a good night, everyone.